Uh, just as a really quick uh, recap to get us back in the zone after our coffees. Um, we've, uh, we've explored the structure of the standard and how it's been developed with Robert. Uh, we've then considered why it's important and how to specify and communicate that to, uh, to stakeholders. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that I don't think it's realistic to ever try and claim that every single batch of trees that we grow uh, perfectly complies to NATSPEC uh, and we never do that. Um, and I don't think ever, any nursery ever will. Um, we do always strive to try and get to that, to that quality benchmark. But what we do do is we try and be transparent about that. So as we're uh, potting plants through our, uh, our production process, uh, we're interrogating those plants, we're looking at the root ball, we're looking at the above ground aspects of the tree, and we're, um, we're scrutinising those and questioning ourselves, does this tree uh, actually comply to that spec? Uh, if it does comply, uh, it keeps going through the system. If it doesn't comply, uh, if it's a real non-conformance, it's, it's actually thrown out. Uh, if it's a minor non-conformance, um, depending on what it is, it will continue to be potted through, but the tree's actually marked uh, on the bag uh, that it's non-conforming. And that way, if we've got a client who absolutely wants a conforming tree, we can look at those different batches and differentiate which ones are 100% NATSPEC and which ones might have a, a minor non-conformance that, that might be okay in most situations. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, uh, we're trying to create a standard for a living thing and, and uh, talking to a few people in the break, ev everyone brings this up. So um, this uh, presenter thing here, um, this is easy to codify. Uh, we can specify that it has to be uh, manufactured with a certain uh, grade of plastic uh, and uh, the laser pointer has a certain class of laser and that can be perfectly measured and it's a black and white yes or no uh, answer to that, it either complies with that particular standard or not. Um, a tree uh, being a living thing, not so easy. Um, it's much more exciting because we, we are dealing with this li living thing that has such a, a broad range of features. Um, so I guess that's one of the um, uh, issues with the, uh, or challenges with the standard is, and, and it's been said before, that it's got to be broad enough to uh, meet a whole spectrum of trees from a magnolia little gem uh, to a massive fig. Um, so there's a challenge in that but and then also it's got to be narrow enough to set a line in the sand and create um, a, a quality standard that you can be uh, assured that you're getting a, a quality product. So, um, so it's going to take too long to go through the whole standard today and a lot of the points I don't think we need to because they, they are pretty clear. Um, but I'd like to draw your attention to a few things um, and maybe point out some of the grey areas and it, and it, and it has already come up today. Um, I think if we can go away with a better understanding of, of, uh, of some of these things that will help you uh, when you're specifying or uh, assessing uh, quality trees. Um, and I guess if I'm jumping between NATSPEC and the Australian Standard, um, I do that because uh, they're very similar. So um, right now we're working with NATSPEC and then obviously sometime next year we'll be looking to work towards the, uh, the Australian standard. Um, so the first thing I wanted to discuss was uh, the root crown. Um, the new Australian standard states that um, trees in containers and ground trees shall have a uh, root crown within the up uppermost uh, five centimetres of the root ball. Um, so firstly, definition of the root crown, I think we all know what it is, but basically it's where the above ground parts of the tree meet the below ground. Um, now, to me, uh, burying a tree uh, with five centimetres of soil, or burying the root crown with five centimetres of soil is a, is, is a serious problem. So this is something that I actually uh, disagree with the standard. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, firstly, um, uh, the tree will become more prone to infection, so it's quite simple. There's soil and moisture sitting around the, the lower bark layer of that tree. Uh, that, that bark tissue becomes necrotic and uh, is effectively deteriorates and exposes itself to uh, collar or crown rot, so phytophthora. Um, also structural failure. So um, uh, what happens here is th uh, the roots will actually grow up uh, from the root crown to the soil surface, which we can see uh, happening here. 
um, and that can occur right up near the stem. Those roots can then deflect back towards the stem and circle that stem. So they become uh, what's known as stem girdling roots. Um, as those roots undergo secondary division, so they, they thicken in girth over time, and of course the stem's doing the same thing, they're compressing against that stem. Uh, and really, at, at the best, they're restricting the uh, ability for the roots to transport uh, moisture and nutrients up to the foliage. Uh, and at the worst, you know, this is where we see in, um, in a big tree, uh, in storm conditions, the tree can just fail and fall over. So this is a, a really serious problem. Um, it also hides all manner of uh, root defects. So if you imagine, uh, if we were to get a, a 200 mil uh, plant that's, that's uh, shockingly root bound, it's got root curling, root girdling, and we then pot that into, let's say, a, a 75 litre uh, container, and we bury it with five centimetres of soil, uh, when we go to do what's known as the, the bend test or the crack test, so we basically put the, put the plant on the ground and we rock the stem from side to side to see whether there's any, any cracking or movement in that root ball at that earlier stage. Of course, that's all hidden underneath that soil um, and you can't see it. But of course, we get these other issues that, that come out of that much later in the piece. Um, and that leads me to talk about um, what I've coined the, the root crown compound effect. Um, so I did, uh, I've been doing quite a bit of study over the last few years and uh, every lecture I went to, every book I had, they had all these terms for everything. So I thought I, I needed to come up with my own term. So basically, um, as it suggests, uh, we supply that tree to the landscaper and um, under this uh, new standard, if it's got five centimetre layer of soil over the top of the root crown, that's fine, that complies, no problem. Uh, the landscaper then takes that plant and plants that and inevitably puts another layer of soil over the top, which, which we see all too often, uh, maybe another, say, 50 millimetres. Uh, and then on top of that, we do our generic 50 to 75 mil of mulch layer on top of that. So that tree is now buried perhaps up to 175 mil under soil. So my recommendation um, with this clause in the current standard is to revert back to what NatSpec states, which is simply that the root crown must be at the um, root ball surface. So it's quite simple and that, and that should be a, a shall thing, so, so a must have. Um, so that sort of leads into, I guess, root division and uh, direction. Um, let me just... So in this context, we're talking about uh, primary root division, which is basically where the, where the, um, the root tip uh, grows out of the centre of the stem and then splits off into two or three new roots. And it continues to do this process here so that we've got uh, total root division. Um, this, has a, this has a couple of benefits. Um, number one, it creates um, enough root mass to support the above ground parts of the tree. So the more root surface area we have, um, the more ability that plant has to take uh, moisture and nutrients up to the top. Uh, if there's no division, uh, what we'll also get uh, is this um, bottom diagram here, potentially where you've got a single stem in the middle of the pot, and then you might have three or four laterals that, that um, extend out to the edge of the pot, and they'll do that exceptionally quickly. And then they hit the edge of that pot deflect and spin around. So what you've got is you've got this, this uh, core area here which, um, which has really no root occupancy or very little and, uh, and is going to be weak at best. And then this massive girdle roots at the edge. Um, now of course you can, you can correct that uh, but um, you're going to lose a great degree of the, of the plant's uh, root, root mass root structure. I think we should also remember that um, these roots here uh, form the, uh, the base of woody roots and the, um, and the secondary woody roots that stay with that plant for life. So they form the, the um, core footing of that plant and um, if they're not right from day one, <laughs> that's it, it's all over. So, um, so it's critical that nurseries uh, do promote this. Um, 
So how do we pro promote um, route division and, uh, and direction? Um, basically we do that uh, one of two ways. So when we're growing the plant from scratch, we're able to actually uh, direct sow into a 90 mil container or a 70 mil container. And I might just pass these around if we can. So basically what we do is we get uh, a couple of seeds, maybe two or three uh, eucalyptus seeds or Banksia seeds, and we, we direct sow straight into that tube in our propagation house. Those seeds germinate. Um, maybe one of them germinates, maybe a couple of them germinate. We actually then cull out anything that we don't need and, and we're left with the single plant. What that allows us to do is create a natural root mass that spreads from the centre of that trunk straight out. And then the next part of our process is, and I might point out too that you notice that these small plants are currently self-supporting, so another benefit of doing it this way. Um, so what we do then, which is the next absolutely most critical step, is we root prune it when it goes into uh, normally a 25 litre container. And um, we do that two ways. So with the um, with those small tubes, we use these very fine pincer scissory thingies, um, which have got, um, they're sharp on both blades, they're both cutting blades. So, um, so we go around and we very gently uh, pull that root ball apart and actually uh, trim it up. Because if I have a look, if I gently, really gently knock one of these out of the pot, if I can, you'll see, you probably can't see at the back, but Basically, there's not much root, root mass there, and that plant's, uh, if I'm too rough with it, it's going to fall apart. But already those roots have gone out to the edge of the pot and actually deflected down. So if we leave them on there and pot that into a 25 litre container, uh, we're going to get an effect called caging, uh, where those roots will, will again be concentrated in, at the core of that plant and not actually grow out to the edge of, uh, of the container. When we get up to uh, the bigger sizes, um, we continue that process. So every time we, every time we pot on the plant, we, we root prune it. If we miss a root prune, we've got the potential that those roots are going to spin around. So this is one of our most critical steps uh, as, a, as a nursery practitioner. Um, and I don't know what proportion of nurseries actually do that, but, but we certainly do with, uh, with all of our trees. So with these bigger ones, Trent, can we... Now this one's very fresh, um, but with these larger trees, again, this, is, this isn't quite ready for sale, but you can see that these roots are um, deflecting downwards. And what we basically do is get a trusty sharp uh, timber saw, and we go around and we cut off a very thin layer of the root system just like that and we basically go around the plant and and prune that back and that and that allows for all these roots to be to be uh, spreading laterally out and then we basically pop that up from there so we go right around and and take off somewhere around an inch okay. yeah yeah absolutely Many yep. about you know uh, girdling roots and the difference between a uh, uh, fibrous girdle, or you know fibrous roots around the edge and a and a woody root, a woody root that is girdling, and yep. what is acceptable at something like this stage. So if, if something yep. like this, which I would consider a woody root, yep. was doing this, yep, you know, yep. Um, if we were checking something at this stage or the next stage, yep. if that was already going that way, yep. I would see that as a rejection. Okay. If it's at... Certainly. Yeah, no problem. If it's at the extremity of the root ball, then providing... Now, I think Natspec has something about it being uh, less than 25% uh, of the stem diameter or something like that, or 10 mil at the most. Um, but 
but yeah, 10 mil. So um, if it's at the extremity, then you've got to consider um, whether you can actually root prune that. Um, if it is at the extremity, um, up to that 10 mil mark, and it's and it's a, a bigger tree, like a like a 100 litre or 200 litre tree, yeah, absolutely, we would think that that's that that's okay, providing that root prune, root pruning process is is carried out correctly. Um, and I'm going to repeat myself on this a couple of times, I think, during this talk, and that absolutely must happen uh, when the contractor is planting that tree into the ground. If you take this plant. Even this fresh one that, that, let's say, doesn't have any, any noticeable girdling roots, there's going to be these really tiny, tiny fine hairs that um, are either deflecting down or going around. And with, um, with secondary division, as, the, as those stems thicken, um, they're going to cause a serious problem. So if they aren't pruned. If they're not pruned, yep, yep. So when we get, I mean, we do this right up to 1,000 litre. So, so if we've got a... Uh, let's say a 600 litre tree and we're putting it into an 800 litre, we will still root prune it. It has to have that root prune or forget it. Um, I've got an example which, which we might uh, go to um, with a batch of trees that we, we did have here. Oh, sorry, we'll move this first. <laughs> right. Yep, okay. So, we had a pre-grow project, and, and thank you, Ingrid, for spruiking pre-grows, because for us, we, we are absolutely behind that. The more time we have, the more we can grow our trees to, to this standard. But this was a pre-grow that came in. We had about, I think, a shade under six months uh, to provide some um, eucalyptus cyroxylene, 100 litre, um, to a council to uh, NAT spec specifications. Uh, we didn't have any of our own pot on material at that point. Uh, so we had to go to another supplier to get some 45 litre stock to pot it on so it would be ready in time. We looked at the trees and we said, yep, these are great. Foliage is great. It's got vigour. The, the apical bud's intact. It all looks good. We took that 45 litre plant. We root pruned it just as I've done there. And, and we thought, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a great tree. So we put it out. And, uh, and grew it on and then uh, one of the steps we took before we actually dispatched the trees was to do a uh, partial sampling test. Um, so what you can see here is the, is the 100 litre plant that looks, um, looks awesome. When I went down to do this test I thought this is you beauty, this is, this is a no brainer, this is so easy. This plant is fantastic. Even when I opened the root ball up and um, went to cut a wedge out, it still looked pretty okay. There's lots of uh, root population through there. Um, there's no massive girdling roots at the edge, so for all intensive purposes, this was a pretty good tree. But, but on further investigation, we found this girdling. And what you can see there is the shape of an eight inch pot. So what it meant was that the, the nursery that we bought this stock from, when they potted it into the 45 litre, didn't root prune it. They let that slide through and of course you can see here that that root's grown and obviously when the tree's this beautiful mature, you know, 30 metre tall thing, that root's going to be like this big. And the other thing to remember with circling roots is that they can never ever change direction. Once a root's going in up direction, it keeps doing that. It will never, even if you put it into new loose soil, it's never going to suddenly go, oh well I'll, I'll sort of go off this way and, and, and exploit that. It's going to keep doing this. So. Um, and, and, and obviously as the tree gets bigger and bigger, that becomes more of an issue. Um, so just, just out of interest, that was, the, that was the form that we filled out. So that's in the back of the NatSpec book. And the new standard has a very similar, what's called a dispatch test, very similar to this. So we go through and we tick off a bunch of criteria. Is it conforming? Is it not? And of course, when we got to the root inspection on this particular batch, uh, it, it wasn't conforming. And so we, we uh, suggested that the client, because it is always up to the client, uh, reject the trees and, and, and that's what the, they did and fortunately they actually extended that time frame and allowed us to grow through some, some much better trees from smaller stock that we had and long term for them obviously that extra six months of waiting is, is a far better result. Um, I'll try and touch on this uh, really quickly. Um, so when we're looking at uh, stem structure you can read 
uh, the definition up the top there. That's that's what's in the uh, new standard. Um, basically, you've got um, stem structure refers to the, um, I guess the the branching. So um, you've got an X current tree, which is basically a single dominant stem with the apical bud right up here uh, intact. You then have decurrent trees, which have divided and the, um, the apical bud's no longer dominant. All of the stems are generally growing at the same, at the same pace. So those two things are fairly easy to define um, and they're okay in the standard. So um, if it's an X current tree, like a pyrus, it says it shall have the apical bud intact. So if that's missing, then that doesn't comply. Uh, and with decurrent, uh, it states that um, the, uh, the branch junctions uh, need to be sound. Um, and that's got to do really with, um, I guess, acute angles of, of bifurcated stems. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that with the included bark bit. But um, there's this other little bit in there that I find really strange, which has a, has a table of trees that um, start out when they're juvenile uh, as, um, as X current and then as they move through maturity change to D current. Now that, that concept's fine, we all know that, that really big trees do that, no problem, but there's no definition of what a mature tree is. So if you put yourselves in the nursery shoes, a mature tree is a 25 litre, a mature tree is a 45 litre uh, not, not a th you know, a thousand litres of super mature tree. So um, if I take that a little bit further, um, there's a couple of plants in the table. There's Corymbia maculata and Corymbia uh, citriodora. Um, so if I provide that tree in a 25 litre container, uh, it's going to be roughly, let's say, 1.5 metres tall. And to comply with the minimum stem requirement, um, which basically states that the tree will not have a clear stem um, over 40% of the height, so if it's 1.5 metres tall, it needs to be 600 mil of clear stem or under to comply. Uh, that means I can interpret it that way to say that it's okay for a Corymbia maculata in a 25 litre to bifurcate at 600 mil above ground level. Now, of course, no nursery in their right mind is going to try and deliver a plant like that, and no client in their right mind is going to accept a plant like that. But You've got to remember in this, in this standard, it, it can be interpreted that way. So I think that definition, and I don't know that I could come up with anything better, but that definition most certainly needs some more work to clarify maybe what pot size that, that, that's okay in, or I don't know. But at the moment, it's, it's, um, I can see that as a real dangerous uh, point. Um, if it remains the same way, uh, I think as, a, as people specifying plants, obviously the easy way to get around that is to say something like the tree must comply to the Australian standard and also have a clear trunk height of, of, of X. Um, but if you don't put that in, you might get a complying tree that, that you're, not, you're not happy with for that, for that reason. Um, so really, really quickly on included bark, um, and, uh, and Ingrid touched on this. Um, oh, thank you. Trent, can we? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know a hell of a lot about included bark because it's, it, it's not so much of an issue um, in the nursery. Um, basically, included bark can be best described by um, bark in a junction that's folded in, uh, so it's concave. Uh, versus extruded bark, which is what we want to see, uh, which is convex. Um, and this creates a structural weakness uh, at that junction. Um, I guess the issue we have with that is, there's a couple of things. When the plant is very small in a nursery situation, it doesn't necessarily have stems that are developed enough to actually uh, give us an indication of whether that tree is, in fact, has included bark or not. The other issue is that a lot of trees are naturally prone to include a bark and unfortunately if we look at this table at the bottom which is included in the standard we've got the prone to include a bark trees um, that stay strong uh, and, um, and if we look at roughly our top selling trees uh, they mirror each other so this is, this is, a, this is a big problem um, and if we look at the actual 
uh, statement in the standard says included bark shall not be present. So in other words, so all nurseries do we do we do we say that well yes we go to the standard but all these trees which happen to be our top ten selling trees that you will want uh, might have included bark so they don't belong in the standard. It, it's again just a really another grey area. I, I absolutely don't know the answer to it, um, but it's something that we need to consider and, and I think it's worth considering whether it is in fact a nursery problem if we're um, nurturing that tree and undergoing proper pruning techniques to try and get that U-shaped uh, um, crutch that, that, uh, that helps um, avoid this problem. Um, you know, is it something that we need to consider as a, as a design issue of, of plant selection or is it something that we need to look at as a maintenance issue because even, I guess even if a tree leaves the nursery and doesn't have included bark and isn't prone to included bark, if it gets mechanical injury on site, uh, something happens to it, it can form included bark later. So I think it's just something to question. And again, that term of included bark shall not be present um, could, could pose an issue for, for both purchasers and nurseries, uh, uh, you know, when this comes in. Sorry, Correct. Ex exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, and, that, and that's where this um, normative and formative statement stuff is really important. It says it shall not have included bark. So, so if we looked at that tree in a, in a let's say it's a 400 litre, and we can see uh, that possibly happening, uh, then it can't be. It doesn't comply. So we can't sell you that tree under the Australian standard. Uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. It does need that. Uh, again, it's just another grey area um, that needs proper assessment by, um, you know, professional horticulturalists or specifiers that, that understand those different things or arborists. Um, so why is self-supporting, uh, I guess, important? Um, and again, I think Ingrid's touched on this a little bit. Um, if we hard stake a tree, uh, it becomes dependent on that, on that uh, stake and uh, we take that stake out and, and the worst thing that can happen is it, it falls over. Um, that type of staking almost in simple terms tricks the tree into thinking the, the trunk is actually thicker than it is. So it says, oh well I don't need to, I don't need to put on caliper growth, I'll just keep, keep um, competing with my neighbours and, and, and shoot for the stars. And so of course that, that growth gets skinnier and weaker and, uh, and ends up flopping over and potentially snapping. Um, but in a nursery situation, staking during the production process um, for, for a lot of trees uh, is really important. And if I go back to my example of the tube here, um, if, I, if I, you can appreciate if I take that tube, it's probably grown a little bit more, um, at that point, it's self-supporting. So if I just take it out, I don't root prune it, I just plant it into the 25 litre container, it will stand up and that stem will probably continue to be uh, self-supporting for some time. But of course we've got all these root issues then that we can't see. So what we do is, as I said before, we, we root prune that plant. That weakens the stem and that plant will actually lie prostrate in the new bag for some time. If we don't stake it and we have trialled not staking it, what happens is you get this plant that, that, that grows out like that and then up. So it just don't, don't work. So what we do with our 25 litre stock is we, we stake it at the extremity like this one here. This is one that's been root pruned and just, uh, and just potted up only a, a few days or a few weeks ago. Um, so we've got two bamboo stakes at the very edge and we've got some budding tape around that plant so that when the irrigation's hitting it, when the wind's hitting it, it's still moving and it's still developing that, um, that caliper down low and that stem taper. Um, so, it is, so it is necessary and it is important to understand that um, with some of our processes, it, 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 it's critical to getting that nice, straight, balanced tree. As we move up, we try and minimise the amount of staking. So uh, this, this 45 litre here, you can see that um, we have a what we call a that's right what we call a storm stake, um, which basically uh, in really heavy wind stops the tree from uh, falling over. But again, there's still that stem movement there to allow 
this down here to thicken up and become self-supporting. Um, one of the, I guess another one of the issues uh, with the standard, with the wording at the moment, it says containerized trees and excrement trees shall be self-supporting at time of dispatch. But then there's this table and it goes on to say that some trees, uh, well actually some trees need that, um, need that stake support after dispatch. So again it's a bit grey um, and it's very size and species dependent. So if we were to grow uh, just uh, Eucalyptus robusta and Saligna, we'd have no issues. We wouldn't need a single stake in this nursery. They are the best behaved plants ever. They're vigorous, they're great. Karimi maculata is the worst kid in the class and unfortunately one of the most popular ones um, and, and, and needs a lot of work. So, so we have to look at it that way. And as I've just explained, it is size dependent. Um, so I guess uh, my suggestion there is really, as a general rule of thumb, I personally feel that anything in, in 100 litre or above should be self-supporting and really ideally shouldn't have the, even these storm stakes. Anything below that, it, it just has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and it all has, so has to take into account the site conditions. If it's going into a, a more protected area with low wind, then it's probably fine to take that stake off and let that, and let that caliper develop. If it's going into a really wind exposed site on the coast, uh, it's going to need it's going to need something. It's going to need something for a while. But the key thing I think with the staking is the stem needs to have that movement. If it doesn't have the movement, um, you, you'll never ever fix it. It needs to have that free movement to keep to keep thickening up. Um, I'll finish the points about the standard uh, with tree balance, and uh, and I, and I I think this is a really uh, great tool. Um, so it helps to tie many components together because it recognises the tree as a system. So a lot of the other things we're talking about include a bark here and we're talking about self-supporting. This tries to tie a lot of those things together to give you um, a sense of proportionality uh, within that plant. So does the below ground uh, aspects of that plant, uh, are they balanced with the above ground components? Can that root ball realistically uh, take enough nutrients and moisture up does it have enough anchorage and ballast so that the plant actually doesn't fall over when it goes out into the landscape? So the way we measure size index uh, is, is with, with, as Ingrid mentioned, that there's, there's this score, there's a lower limit, and there's an upper limit, um, which I'll jump to. So, and this is, I guess, by way of example, is, is another sort of gray area where, where this is a, a great indicator um, but if we take this as absolute gospel, uh, it, it can lead us astray a little bit, I feel. So if we look at, um, where are our trees, Trent? Drag these out. Okay, I'll just, I'll just leave these here for a second then we'll move them to the side so we can see the screen again. But basically these trees are in the same pot size. They have different growth characteristics. You've got a Tristania lorina luscious on the right or your left. Um, it's in a 75 litre container. Uh, it's got good stem taper. It's got a really nice balanced crown, uh, ready to go. Now to do my size index score, what I do is actually um, just measure just measure basically the height of that tree from the root crown to the very top and then I measure the caliper from 300 mil above crown level and I multiply those together and I get a score for that particular tree. So this tree, the luscious scores uh, 40 times 2.6, 104. Um, the tree next to it, which is a 75 litre uh, Lagostroma tuscarora, the same deal, same pot size. Uh, so I again measure the height and measure the caliper at 300 mil and that gives me a score of basically 64. So we might drag these back out, Trent. Just put that over there. So to me, I, I see both of these trees as ready for sale. I see both of these trees as healthy, good trees. In all other respects, 
They're, uh, they're self-supporting, they're balanced, um, there's no sign of pests and diseases, all, all of that other stuff. Um, but if we look at the score, the, the Tristania uh, just makes it, so a score of 104. That probably sounds about right, because if that tree gets any bigger, really it does need to be potted up. So, so that's, that's pretty okay. Um, the 75 litre Lagostromia uh, only scores 64. So, um, so we're, what's that, about uh, 14 uh, points uh, below the, the lower limit. Um, so that would mean that that Lagostromia doesn't comply and we couldn't, we couldn't uh, dispatch that plant. So, Can I just say, well, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. The major criteria that we were worried about was the upper end. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, okay, moving on. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the trap, isn't it? Like, um, you could have a bad tree uh, that meets the, so the score um, and a good tree precluded because it don't meet this sort of lower limit. Um, now, yes, that tree's got, got room to grow and it, and it will, it will um, meet that size score at some point. Um, but really, if that's the best tree on the market today, should that be something that, because right now it's a shell, should that be something that stops, stops the purchase of that tree? Well, probably not. Um, so in my opinion, and it sounds like I'm agreeing with Ingrid and, and Tony, basically the upper limit I agree with, because we, we, we definitely don't want trees that are too big, um, but I disagree with the lower limit. I think it should be a, a should or, or you know, taken out altogether, providing that the tree meets the other criteria, which I think is 2.2.6, which is um, root ball occupancy. So the root ball needs to be properly populated with roots and hold together. Of course, it needs to meet to meet that. So that's my um, take. Uh, so I mean, really, just to wrap up, um, in conclusion, it's never going to be black and white. Um, we're living, with, we're dealing with a living product, and that's fantastic. We love that. Um, so I think it's really good if if um, people who are specifying, planting, uh, assessing trees can understand what, I guess, work their way through what are truly. Um, like what I call threshold issues. So what, what's negotiable in this standard and what's not? Because it's, it's never going to be black and white. Um, we absolutely need to uh, establish an accreditation system. So the standard at the moment, we have to do a dispatch test uh, within two weeks of sending that plan out. So I did a quick addition. We send out about probably 40 truckloads a day, maybe more in spring. Each of those truckloads has a plant on it. Um, and it takes about 20 minutes to do an assessment. So that's about 800 minutes, which is about 13.5 hours to assess the trees to go on a truck for one day. Um, which, uh, and it's just not necessary. It's just, um, I guess the exception I take to it is that often that paperwork sort of doesn't go anywhere. It's, it's so that someone can tick a box to say, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it complies. But, but, you know, that paperwork that really does mean something doesn't, doesn't really go anywhere. And, that, and that's why we're really for an accreditation system where we can prove to an independent auditor that our, that our processes along the way, exactly the things we've talked about here, are, are correct and produce the desired outcome, all, all of these factors. Um, and we would do that by, by evidence of documents, um, showing them the processes, and also samples. So, so they would come out to the nursery and they would say, show me some, what you call some conforming trees. And, and they would go and assess those trees to check, I think, our understanding of whether, you know, uh, do we know what we're talking about or not. Um, the nursery industry is in a fantastic position to be that auditing body. Uh, we have uh, what's called uh, industry development officers in each state IDOs, uh, and they do a lot of accreditation for nurseries at the moment for NIASA and EcoHort. They could be easily trained um, to be an auditing body and, and really take on that role. And that would be really valuable to us as a, as a levy payer, because essentially the nurseries are paying their wages, but also to you, particularly where you might not be the client, you might be the person uh, specifying the, 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 the tree, and then that then gets handed over to uh, a contractor, 
and, and, that, and, and there's a client involved and that process gets, uh, gets lost along the way. Um, so I, I'll finish on this point which, which really, really gets under my skin um, and Ingrid talked about as well with this bloody root barrier things. Good trees don't compensate for bad design, bad planting and bad maintenance. So this standard um, lifts the nursery game which is fantastic but you take that fantastic product, put it into shit soil, pick the wrong plants, don't root prune it, stake it, whatever, um, all of that work we do is completely undone and it, and it frustrates us to no end because we see it too, too often. So um, 